This week on The Change Law, we're taking you to the hallway track of All Things Open 2022 in Raleigh, North Carolina. Let me set the stage. This is what we do when we go to these conferences. We set up our podcast studio at our booth where all the other vendors are. We give out t-shirts, stickers, pins, high fives. We're there to cover the hallway track and meet everyone we can. Today's anthology episode from All Things Open features Arun Gupta, VP and GM of Open Ecosystem Initiatives at Intel, longtime friend Chad Whitaker, head of open source at Sentry, and Ricardo Suedas, Principal Advocate in Open Source at AWS. The common denominator for each of these conversations is advocating for and supporting open source. A big thank you to our friend Todd Lewis and his team for inviting us to come back to All Things Open. We enjoy meeting longtime fans and new ones too. And of course, a massive thanks to our friends and partners at Fastly and Fly. Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. And our friends at Fly let you put your app and your database close to your users all over the world with no ops required. Check them out at Fly.io. This episode is brought to you by Influx Data, the makers of the Influx DB Time Series platform. With its data collectors and scripting languages, a common API across the entire platform, and highly performant time series engine and storage, InfluxDB makes it easy to build once and deploy across multiple products and environments. The new InfluxDB storage engine allows developers to build real-time applications even faster and with less code, faster write and query performance with a new purpose-built columnar time series database that combines a hot, compressed, in-memory data store and a cold object store. Unlimited cardinality lets you slice and dice on any dimension without sacrificing performance. And more options than ever to query data, including native SQL support. If you want to learn more and see how the new InfluxDB engine works, sign up for the InfluxDB beta program at InfluxDB.com slash changelog. Again, InfluxDB.com slash changelog. Let's talk about Intel, because uh, when I think of Intel, I think of an industry giant. I think of microchips. I think of Intel inside. Yes. I think of hardware. I don't think of open source much, but I guess you're changing that narrative, helping us understand like what Intel does for the for the developer communities, for the open source community, et cetera. Yeah. No, I mean, um, I joined Intel about six months ago. Uh, I run the open ecosystem team at Intel. And um, the funny part is, I call my role as Chief Storytelling Officer. Okay. I know Intel has done open source for over two decades, actually. We were influential in creating Linux Foundation. We are part of 700 plus open source foundation and standard bodies. For the last 15 years, we are the top corporate contributor to Linux kernel. Really? Uh, We are among the top 10 contributors to Kubernetes. Um, we are among the top contributors to Open JDK, PyTorch, TensorFlow, LLVM. These are the projects wow. that I didn't, I didn't sometimes you don't that. realize that Intel is contributing. Yeah. So we have always been there. So mm-hmm. my role really here is to make sure we tell the story better. Right. That's it. This is a challenge for many brands in tech, really. I mean, they, they have such a focus on selling their product that they forget to tell their story, right? And I think that's part of the story is like you're not just the microchip manufacturer that you are and like the heartbeat of most computers, it's it's beyond that. It's the community partner, community citizen, and like how are you cohesively involved? I think brands just forget to really tell that part of the story and they just, the chief storytelling officer I think is an amazing title. We should have more out there because that's kind of what marketing does, but it's not their job. Their job is to like help people be aware what the product is, not necessarily a brand story, but they kind of go together. How do you how do you deal with that challenge with like no, marketing and storytelling and very whatnot? Very much so. And actually, the part and we, I work with our marketing team very closely. Yeah, helping them understand that mind share is what gives you market share. Helping them build that I understanding like that. that funnel is very important because all along, I mean, over the twenty years, open source has only grown. And it is sort of the primary way. Open source developers are the new decision makers. 
you no longer go to CIOs and they say, you know what, sign a bill. Right. If the developers are happy, bottom up. if they are engaged yeah. in the, exactly, if they are engaged in the community, if you have showed them the right skills, they're going to make the change in the organization. And most of the time, these days, developers are building their applications on a CSP, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, private cloud, whatever, Edge. Intel is prominent across all of these, you know, Intel architecture is prominent across all of these venues. Yeah. And that's exactly, you know, what we do is, we contribute to all the projects that I talked about earlier. We want to make sure that these open source communities are fully optimized and run in the most efficient manner for the developers. Mm. We just have to do a better job of storytelling. Do you get involved in the OSPO related matters? Like we, were, we had Chad Whitaker on from Century earlier. He's talking about their how they give back, and it's $2,000 per developer they have on their team now. Obviously, Intel's probably got more than 2,000 developers. I don't know. How many developers does Intel have at, yeah. at large, you know? So Intel has over 19,000 19, software engineers. Wow. Over 19,000 software engineers, and so that? OSPO is part of my team. So one of the okay. teams I have is Open Source Program Office. I've actually built and ran OSPOs at Amazon and Apple. Okay. So I've built my career over the last 20 years all exclusively on open source. So I kind of been around for a while. Yeah. And here, honestly, the part that gets me most excited is Intel has done so much in the open source world. When I was given an offer to join Intel, I was like, what does Intel do in open source? And now I'm thinking. like getting goosebumpy moments every day is that right? as I talk to maintainers, as I talk to executives across the company. Yeah. We just got to do a better job of storytelling. So how long have you been at Intel then? Oh, we're six months now. Six months, okay. Mm -hmm. So you're getting started. Still, yeah. Just I mean, getting warmed up. up. Okay. Just getting, getting warmed, warmed up. up. So I guess the gift of, and the curse of a strong brand and a long-standing history is that it can be very, the gift is it's strong and it's long-standing. And so you have this, like, you've been cemented in the mind of people. The hard part is changing that perspective. You know, we've watched Microsoft transform slowly from evil empire into like open source supporting pioneers in certain senses. Mm -hmm. Some people still don't believe that narrative, but we've seen kind of the mind of developers slowly change about Microsoft over the last five, 10 years. And so I'm just wondering like how, how you attack the challenge of people who think Intel and don't think anything, we don't think about software, we don't think about open source. I had no idea that they contributed to Linux kernel and Kubernetes and all these things. And that's an awesome story, but like, how do you get that story out there and sustain it and actually get people to realize it and change their minds? Right, and that's exactly my job. That's exactly, so I have a OSPO team, right. you know, which is all on the open source compliance processes part of it. I have an events team. So this event is sponsored by Intel out of my team and my budget. Yeah. You know, we were at KubeCon last week. We we're going to be at LF Member Summit last week, next week. Uh, I'm also part of several foundation boards. So I am on the CNCF governing board and the okay. governing board chair. I'm also on the OpenSSF governing board. I'm the alternate on the Linux Foundation board. So really meeting our industry peers, influencing the direction, yeah. wearing like an Intel t-shirt. There you go. Yeah. Whatever story I tell, as long as you're wearing that Intel brand, it's, it's a long journey. You know, I'm not yeah. in it for the short run. Right. I'm a marathon runner, I'm not a sprinter. So I'm like really pacing myself and Open source developers are always skeptics. I have, I'm, I'm an open source developer myself. Yeah. I need to hear that message through my multiple channels in order to start believing it. And see mm -hmm. it for yourself for a while, exactly. too. Exactly, so yeah. that's, that's sort of the approach here, that we're going to start making ourselves prominent across these different channels, why it matters, how it matters. Kathy Zhang, she is part of the CNCF Technical Oversight Committee, elected member over there. She gave a keynote at KubeCon last week. And I think she said it well, that we want to benefit the open source community as much as open source community has benefited us. So that's sort of the party line yeah. on how I see this going, yeah. because then you know it's a fair relationship. Symmetrical. Do you think part of your, I guess since you've got six months in so far, you think part of your journey and part of your challenge with Intel might be changing the inside of Intel to more better embrace open source and better understand the story? Like, is there any uphill battle within Intel you have, not just externally, like getting other developers or the open source community to understand Intel's story in open source and how you support open source is part of your struggle and challenge from within? 
I don't think so at all, actually. <laughs> if you think that about it. That makes it easier. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's the world changer. It's the game well, changer. Because you're so prolific and you're so embedded, you personally, I wonder if like a lot of the, the gain and benefit is not so much just you, but you bring a lot to the table, right? You bring a lot of uh, skin in the game, a lot of trust from past experience and how you've personally been in the trenches for so long. I just wonder if like, if, if they're aligned, if your experience and what you bring and what Intel brings, obviously they're big, but do they align well? Maybe that's why you took the job. No, they do. They do. Yeah. They, they very well do, actually. And you know, throughout my career, I've always, like, I'm a runner, okay? So as a runner, I like doing uphill runs. I don't like downhill runs. I mean, they're required because... Yeah, but, uh, How about flat? yeah. Well, flat is okay. Flat <laughs> is boring. Flat. Yeah, I'm an uphill runner. Ten percent I'm not much of a runner though. Yeah, I love uphill runs. So, I mean, I really see this is an uphill run, and I'm really enjoying it. If you hear Pat and Greg Lavender, our CTO, talk about their strategy as the company is pivoting towards software-first narrative, open ecosystem is front and center of the strategy. So, having that top corporate alignment across the company, yeah. having a leader like Pat and Greg at the top with such a strong conviction, actually, you know, you don't have to do much. You just have to kind of rally up people, build the strategy and say, this is what we're going to focus on for the next year. So I think internal, there are always going to be naysayers. So right. you have to kind of work them along, nudge them along. And I worked at companies like Amazon and Apple, build the open source narrative over there. So I'm not at all afraid in that sense. Yeah. But I think it's a lot going to be how do we make ourselves accessible, available, transparent to the open source community so that they start believing us? Because right. as they say, the first person to stop fooling is yourself. But we believe in this very strongly and we hope that passion comes across clearly to the open source community. Yeah. yeah. So you've talked a couple of ways that you're supporting open source developers. One is direct committing to the projects. Like that's the best form of support is like we actually submit code to the Linux kernel the other one is sponsoring events and and conferences like this one. What are some other ways that Intel can support the community? Oh yeah, I mean like um, code is king in open source community. So contributing code is the best way yeah. by which we can do that. Sponsoring events is what make these open source thrive because that's where you find out about it. As I said, we, we are part of several foundations as well. Right, so we continue to do that over there. We do a lot of open source mentoring, multiple ways we engage, you know, pull request reviews, giving keynotes, you know, talking to other developers, and not just for us, but how do we make the broader open source community better? So that is sort of a personal goal of myself that I would love to do, I mean, I've been doing open source mentorship for a while, Yeah. we want to do more of it. Mm -hmm. So let's, like, as they say, the rising tide raise all the boats. Right. So I'm really looking at how can we raise all the boats together? Sure. Yeah. So that's, you're still early, but what might that open source mentorship look like or manifest as, as you establish it? What? We don't know yet. I don't mean, know it's yet. very early in the yeah. cycle. Gotcha. But really the focus for now is gonna be, tell that story in a very authentic, very connected, very transparent way. And course correct if that story is not gelling with the developers. Like we can't go with a very strong mindset that this is our story. I'm always looking for change you know, what is it gelling, what is it not gelling, and be able to tune our messaging, still keeping true to ourselves. What does your team look like? What do you break down, like the OSPO and other things that are involved under your role? Like, what does that look like? How many people are involved? We don't share the number of people usually, but I have an OSPO team that is for all typical OSPO related functions. I have a community and a DevRel team, you know, that maintains open.intel.com, that's our public facing website, blogs, yeah. et cetera, over there. And I have a team that is all focused internal strategy and alignment, where we work across multiple BUs to bring them on the same page or understand what their strategy is. So a lot of internal alignment. Gotcha. All right, belabored segue here. You're talking about telling Intel's story. That's a communication skill. Communication skills are technical, non-technical skills. <laughs> you just gave a keynote about non-technical skills and how important they are. Let's talk about that. Sure, yeah, well, I mean, um, as I said in the keynote, non-technical skills are really a force multiplier to a technical skills. And in an open source community, which is so globally diverse, so inclusive, we these non-technical skills are really your differentiator. Right. And in the keynote, I particularly talk about kindness and gratitude. 
I think as an industry, we don't do a good job of talking about kindness and gratitude enough. Yeah. We can only be more kind, only be more, more gratuitous. So that's the skill I talked about and how that brings a more meaningful connection at work, how you know, it gives you more serotonin, you know, you know, how it produces endorphins as a painkiller, cuts down your cortisol level, all of that. So kindness and gratitude truly has benefits you know, at work, at your personal life. But then later today at 12.45, I'm also giving a talk which talks about three other skills, communication, right. conflict resolution, and adaptability. Yeah. Conflict's a big one. It's a, it's a challenging one. So if you're looking at uh, a non-kindness, let's say, how do you, give me an example of like a non-kindness and a way you would respond with kindness and an example of a kindness and gratitude when you speak of that. Like, yeah, so let's say- How do you see that manifesting? Yeah, no, I mean, in a work setting, particular work setting, let's say you see a new employee join in and them struggling out, you know, how to navigate the org or them not being able to ask a question because they feel threatened, they have an imposter syndrome, whatever it is, right? Just talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Just help them understand that, hey, you know what? I know you are new. Sometimes these things could be overwhelming. Uh, my son is a junior at UPenn, and as he did internship this year, he was saying, you know, I don't understand the org structure. So there was somebody else who helped him understand the org structure. So I think that's a simple example. Mm -hmm. You see somebody struggling, you offer help, that, hey, I'm gonna help you understand the org structure, and let's say if they are threatened to ask a question, if you are senior in the team, yeah. talk to your manager. That let's create space for these new people in the team who are early in their career. Give them that flexibility. Give them that space where they feel encouraged. You know, give them that psychological safety in the yeah. team. So I think that's a very simple act of kindness. Like yeah. Helping somebody, let's say a person new in their career send a pull request. Say, hey, I'm gonna volunteer to do a code review and really, help them understand how code, lots yeah. and lots of examples that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis. So you're talking about conflict resolution, dopamine, serotonin, these are neuroscience related ideas Very and much. sciences, right? Do you study psychology, neuroscience? Like how do you, how do you up your game when it comes to this, this background of knowledge? Yeah, no, I, uh, I'm a runner. So okay. I try to run every day or lift <clears throat> and one of the things that I love doing running is listening to a lot of podcasts. So I listen to a lot of podcasts, particularly around mindfulness. Okay. Um, there is a podcast by Dan Harris, who was an ABC News anchor for 20 years. He had a national breakdown on national TV, and he changed his career from a news anchor on Good Morning America. He runs a podcast on mindfulness. So I listen to a lot of that, and they talk about a lot of these elements over there. Then I also listen to a podcast by um, uh, <clears throat> Adam Grant. Uh, he's an organizational psychologist at Wharton's and he wrote the book, um, Rethink. And I listened to a lot of his podcasts and pretty much the theory and the concepts behind these podcasts is what gets me excited that it truly is, you know, when yeah. you start reading the study behind it, yeah. that it actually releases those hormones that makes it so much better. Right. It's very exciting. Yeah. And it's very, as they say, you know, it's a very, Eureka moment. Oh, I didn't realize it. It's so yeah. simple. Right. That's a true connection. I mean, people forget they have a brain, right? We're so human, we forget that we have a brain. The brain is the most powerful organism that we have in our body. If it didn't do what it does, we would not do what we do. That's it. And if you don't have your brain, you're not you anymore. Like you, like either maintaining it from your diet, your exercise, so that you don't have dementia or get like diseases that come from all these different things in life. And just, you know, over time things happen to our human bodies, but we forget that our brain is just such a critical organ that we have that we're just like, we don't think to study it. You know, we Correct. don't think to understand how it works and how we work with it. Right. You know, and how it so much is exactly who we are. You and know? I think you, you brought up a really good point over there because oftentimes we see the signals in our body um, that I'm not feeling, uh, I'm feeling lethargic or I'm gaining weight right. or my arms are not looking good. You can see those symptoms and start working out, physically working out. How do you recognize those simple for mental fatigue? Right. So I think as much as it is important for your physical well-being, it's very equally important. I would say rather more important for your yeah. mental well-being. So feeding your mind these kind of content about general kindness, gratitude, you know, being a nicer person. I mean, end of the day, the summary is 
just don't be stupid. Be a nice person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, we forget sure. that sometimes. Right. It's, it does simplify down. I do like the way you described the difference between technical and non-technical skills in a way that's easy to understand is the technical skills are what we know and the non-technical skills are who we are. We have tried and true methods for changing what we know, right? Like you put your head in a book and you read it or you go get some experience. Changing who you are can be a more difficult matter. Do you have any advice on changing yourself so that you yeah. improve yeah. your skills? No, and I think unfortunately over the last three, four years is where there are courses coming up where they talk about these non-technical skills that why they are critical. Yeah. But there is not a whole lot of material over there. I would say my personality has changed, evolved over the last few years as I have started listening to these podcasts. So I would really encourage people to find, to start reading about it. Right. And sometimes you don't realize how consciously or subconsciously it starts impacting you. Like mindfulness you know, is such a such an important thing we don't realize it. You know, we always, always either ruminating in the past or being anxious about the future and spoiling our past for that. So how just being mindfully present in the current moment would really allow you to enjoy and soak it in and move forward. I think yeah. that to me yeah. has really brought a lot of peace and calm to myself, to within myself. And once you have that within you, then you're a lot nicer person to everybody else. Right. Yeah. We, uh, we have a podcast in our network called Brain Science, and my co-host, it's on a hiatus right now, but we're actually in talks of bringing it back. Shout out to Marielle. But we're, uh, she's a doctor in clinical psychology, and so I'm the layman, basically. I'm the non-neuroscience graduate, and she is the doctor. And uh, one thing we say on that show is, be your own scientist. And I think what happened with you, and maybe part of your shift, was self-awareness. And so a lot of this question you asked, Jared, and this change of who you are, this, the first step to changing who you are is being self-aware of who you are, right? If you don't know who you are, you can't understand why you are who you are and what you're right. doing and stuff like that. And so right. as you become more aware or self-aware of the things that perplex you or you know upset you about who you are or things you want to change, you can only change what you measure and you, you can only change that if you're aware that it exists or whatnot. So I would say that maybe part of your change was the fact that you became more aware of knowledge and more self-aware of what you, of how you, you mirror image from that knowledge. Like who, his, this is what neuroscience says I am from a brain perspective, a personality perspective. This is the, the knowledge out there and this is who I think I am. And through that you're like, well, this is who I want to be. And maybe through your running and self-awareness, you probably have tons of time to think when you're running, right? So while you're running, you're listening, you're reflecting, you're retrospectiving, you know, all these things. How and long so, do you run generally? Uh, anywhere from half an hour to hour and a half every Woo. day. That's a lot of time to think. Yeah. yeah, well, and I think you, Adam, you brought up a really good point because if you can't measure it, if you don't know what needs to be fixed, yeah. you know, as they say in software, the hardest problem is to find the bug. Right. Once you know the bug, then right. you can debug it rather quickly yes, and so get the solution out. So I think, I would say two people that probably know you the best and can give you good advice, controversial ones, your partner and your boss. Yes. And be very open and receptive to their feedback. Don't go with a judgmental mind. Sure. Whatever they say, listen in, soak it in. Yep and see what needs to change. Because truth. that'll make your work truth, life truth, happy. Truth, truth, Yeah, that'll make your work life happy and home life happy. Yeah. That's, That's where you're all split. happy right there. Yeah. This concept of being your own scientist though is this concept of curiosity, right? If you're not curious who you are and what you are, then how are you gonna reflect the world? You know, how are you gonna be a participant in community, a participant in your workplace, in your family, in your friend groups, whatever, mm -hmm. like you'll be maladaptive as Marielle says. She doesn't like to say bad. She doesn't like to say negative. She likes to say maladaptive. Uh, you know, if, if you don't have this idea of curiosity and this ability to say, this is, you know, the, the be your own scientist, like be curious and sort of like self-document who you think you are and then reflect on that. It's kind of like journaling, things like that. You hear this advice a lot. Yeah. It's almost painfully cliche, like to say, well, you know, the way to get better is be self-aware and to journal and things like that. And it's like, I know that advice, but it truly is true. Like if you know who you are, it's easy to understand who you are and to change if you don't like that reflection. Absolutely, you know, I mean, look yourself in the mirror. Yeah. You know, physically you see, I don't like myself physically, right. but you can't do that mentally in a mirror. So look in a mental mirror. Yeah. And I think your spouse and your boss are probably the best mental mirror on how you're operating. Right. Because they have the right perspe perspective at least. Yeah. 
Probably check in with your parents too. They know you pretty well, depending on your age. Yeah, it yeah. depends, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. Well, I think the parents thing is, they will never give you a critical feedback. With boss and spouse, uh, they'll give you a critical feedback, which is what you need. Right. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned the tease for later. So no one listening to this show right now is here at this conference, so they can't go at 11.45 and listen to your talk. But you mentioned conflict resolution, which I think is key, and adaptability. Can you kind of unpack just a little tease to what you're going to talk about? Absolutely. When you think about conflict resolution, I think one of the biggest things in conflict resolution is how do you separate task conflict versus personality conflict? You know, we are all aware of the Peter Druckmann's model of forming, storming, norming, performing. If I'm not familiar with that. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not either. <laughs> well, so there is a Peter Druckmann's model that if you are building a new team, there are four stages. Forming, storming, norming, and performing. Forming okay. is when the team is coming together. Storming is when you're trying to understand what everybody's roles and responsibilities okay. are. Norming is gotcha. when you really start like gelling with each other and performing is you're performing at the top notch. Okay. Nice. Okay. Four stages, right? So they say in the early stages is a lot of personality conflict because you don't know the people. Oh yeah. And less about task conflict. But as you go towards more advanced stages, personality conflict goes away and it's all become task conflict and that's what makes your team performing. That's what allows you to be more productive right. because I am able to look through you as a person and say, hey, you know what, the problem is in the task, not in the person. So I think that's a very important element about differentiating between task conflict and personality conflict. That's what I'm going to talk about okay. in that particular one. On the adaptability side, you know, they talk about is the survival of the fittest. That's the Darwinian theory. But if last three years have they taught anything, is survival of the most adaptable. Mm. Mm. And there have been studies done again. I think there's a talk by a doctor, by one of the doctors on TEDx. She talks about studying 10,000 living organisms. One thing that keeps them alive, and this is not humans, living organisms, yeah. plants, trees, etc. Adapt. Adaptability. Yeah. That is fundamental. Resilience, adaptability, yeah. they kind of get, they're synonymous in, in some ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, yeah, so I'll it, talk about that element on why, yeah. how adaptability at work, like yeah. schedules change, you know, teams change, right. somebody new. We were just talking about that with regard to artists and yes. generative AI, and where it's like you can't, go and change the fact of the reality that this stuff exists, artists need to adapt and coders, yeah, yes. as generative, as code generation becomes better and better and better, software yeah. developers are going to have to adapt, right. move up the value chain, right? Exactly. And artists are doing that. So like either adapt or you or you die, right? It, yeah, I mean, there's a book um, uh, which talks about who moved my cheese. Oh my gosh. Yes. I was, I, I'm just about to mention that. <laughs> it is. A f I'm he like, he, moved was, it. he, he yeah. said first, I was going to talk about that book. It's like, we've mentioned that book, obviously. It's, Spencer you have Johnson. to read it. It's I a, love it. It's what, an hour or two maybe I'm, read? It's, it's 90 short. 90 page, short yeah. guide. Yeah. guide. Everyone who deals with change, which is every human being, yeah. should read or at least Read the summary of that book because it's such a good book it's to awesome. understand change. You have to adapt. Yeah. And in that book, Spencer Johnson makes a quote. He says, if you do not adapt, you become extinct. Yeah, there that you go. That is exactly what is true. I yeah. mean, we have seen what happened to BlackBerry, Blockbuster, you know, right. um, uh, Steven Spielberg. This guy was rejected by USC Cinematic Arts School. And now they have a building in his honor. Oh, wow. Michael Jordan. He was cut. They from was. his freshman's high team or yeah. sophomore high team. Yeah. We know who Michael Jordan is. Yes. Right. So, I mean, there are, if these people would not have adapted, they would yes. be nowhere. Yes. You can't just sulk and cry. Right. And, you know, it's okay to sulk and cry. Right, but then get yeah. up but and get over change. It and <laughs> change, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, I think, and the, the, other, the last, the first skill that I talk about is communication. And in that, we talk about how it is important to do mindful talking and reflective listening. You know, it is super important that when you're talking to somebody, there's an intent and there's an impact. Are those two aligned? Because there could be left right. several factors around you by which the other person may not be hearing it well. Are you doing it well? And then the second part is a reflective listening. Right. Am I listening to you as opposed to, I mean, as Stephen Covey said, most people listen with an intent to reply back as opposed to understand the point of view. Right. They're waiting for their turn to talk. Right. And they think, oh, uh, uh, uh. 
Can I finish my I sentence? I almost cut you off there. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but I, that's I had to do it. My bad. No, no, no. Yeah, hey, no, it's yes. all good. I'm it good. But I think we do that. Those we do that as podcasters often right. because we do this every day. Right. So we listen to a lot of people and we have to respond. But we're, we also have this pressure to be smart on these microphones, mm -hmm. to have a point to say, to say it eloquently and to be heard. And sometimes you don't listen very well because you're just kind of like, you want to bring up who, uh, the cheese book. Exactly. Yeah, I'm going to bring this up. Plausible science There's or There's a question something. lingering right. in your mind. Precisely. Uh, imagine the person is and talking for And a desire to make the conversation good, though, too. Correct. Right? I mean, Correct. Sure. in everyday conversation, you're, you're not on a microphone. It's not recorded and played back to thousands and thousands of people all over the world, so you don't have that pressure. But in our case specifically, we do have that pressure. So we do want our shows to be well-received right. and liked and right. a good narrative, a good story arc yeah. to, the sh to the thing, too. We have an agenda of sorts Agreed. we have no, to no. maintain. No, I agree. Completely agree. I mean, yeah. imagine somebody is talking for 45 seconds, you listen to the first 15 seconds, and then the question is lingering in your mind. Mm -hmm. You have not paid any attention for the next 30 seconds. Yeah. That's not mindful talking or right. reflective listening. It's you hard are to not hold on to that question, but still continue forward. Yeah. And it is. Like, go with them. Well, put a notepad. Yeah. Write down the question. Because oftentimes, you are wanting to jump in with the question because you think you'll forget the question. Right. Have a notepad. Right. Get out your phone. Put it on a note that I want to ask that question. You can always Speaking come back to the context. Yeah. Speaking of notes, I, I, do have, I do that in my brain when we talk. So I have this virtual notepad that I write a question on or write a note on, and that one is conflict resolution. I want to go back to this thing that we were talking about there because one thing with conflict that's interesting is that, and you mentioned with this, What's the, what is the... Uh, Peter Druckmann's model. Peter Druckmann's model. Forming, storming, norming, and performing. Right, so as part of that, that initial stage, right, I, I imagine it kind of like a puzzle, right? When you put a puzzle piece together into it, it doesn't always perfectly go in. You kind of have to like shift Bridge it. it in. And, yeah. and so what happens is you go from disconnection to connection. Yeah. And conflict usually happens when you're disconnected, right? You become disconnected. So I want to kind of go back to that point. I've been meeting, so I just wanted to... No, no, you know, fantastic. Hold on to this question. I've been holding on to that. So I want to use your point to go back to that if we, if Thank we could. You. Thank you. And I think I was reading a story about Wilbur uh, Wright Brothers on how they created the first plane. And in that story, I was reading about conflict resolution that these two brothers had only task conflict. They would fight with each other like hell, but on a task. End of the day, they will still sit down together, have a beer. Right. And that's how they came up with the plane. Is that right? That's a good so, story. So, I mean, there are yeah. so many stories where conflict resolution you know, is a key. And it seems like the, their ability to do that has to have something to do with disconnecting from the task at hand, like their personal identity, right? Right, Because you can actually not like my idea or the way I'm, my process and say, that's a bad process, here's a better one. And I can uh, take that and I can adapt and change and agree with you. Or I can say, well, that's my idea or that's my process. And so you're attacking my process, therefore you're attacking me. Right. But right. what happened though was at the end of the day they went back together and had that beer. Right, the connection. They remained connected. Well, they were brothers, right? So right? Yeah. when you disconnect, yeah. you don't have communication. So Correct. you walk away or they walk away assuming right. well, he's stewing, they're stewing, I'm stewing, whatever. Right. So much assumption and it's not true. And when you come back together and you say, well, let's continue this day or this beer, like you remain connected, you remain right. united in your efforts of whatever it might be. It's the, the act of connection that brings us back together and resolves conflict. It does, it does. And, and I think it's a lot harder in this Zoom world, oh, yeah. where exactly. as long as the discussion is over, you just shut the laptop down, it's like, I'm just walking out of here. Right. right. No. Or text communications. Yeah, harder, exactly. Right? Because I, I remember, <clears throat> I think KD, um, who used to be a warrior, who joined war, uh, San Francisco Golden Gate Warriors team, Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant. Yeah. So he sent a message to his teammate when he was leaving, leaving OKC Thunder over a text message. He said, hey, I'm leaving the team. <laughs> Ouch, dude, you were the star player right. of OKC Thunder you, you for so many years. You can't do that years. kind of stuff disconnected. Yeah, and that, yeah. Uh, Face to face. Pissed off. Come together. Of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. Exactly. Yes. So I think if we realize these are day-to-day -day situations, day-to-day -day things right. that we can always do better. Well, it yes. seems like uh, one of the skills of communication is picking the right medium for communication, right? Like, true. his message there would have probably been much better received personally. Yeah. Because it's important, right? And he picked the wrong medium for communication, and that that right. delivered his, I don't know, lack of care. It, right. it, was, it itself was a message, the right. fact that it was a text message. Yeah. And so that's such a struggle sometimes, is like knowing when do I put the texting down and pick up the phone, or when do I hop off the phone and drive over to their house? The right. Wright brothers had two things going. They were brothers, 
which means they had a connection, but also they were sitting right with each other. Right. Difficult for us in the digital age, like you said. Well, I think one thing I would recommend is put yourself in the recipient's shoe. Yeah. Empathy. Would, would you like, exactly. Yes. Would you like to be in that position yeah. that somebody texted Text you, you? I'm leaving. My five-year-old friend where we are competing in the court every day together, practicing every day together, and texting me, how would you feel it? Right, right. So have that empathy, and that goes a long way. Yes, yes. Well, we can't invite everybody to your talk, but you do write on a blog for Intel, so it's open.intel. Do you blog, is that where the blog is at? That's right. I didn't pay attention to the link. I, I saw right. the page, yeah. I didn't pay attention to the URL I was going to. So open.intel has your post and other posts from your team there. Right. Uh, I'm sure this talk you're giving will be on YouTube as part of All Things Open. Yeah. Where else can people ca catch up with you or pay attention to your journey at Intel? Yeah, my uh, Twitter handle is the best. Arun Gupta, one word. You know, that's where I tweet prolifically. I try to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so catch me there. My DMs are open. I think Brian was talking about it. You know, I'm a servant leader here, so uh, reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about anything, literally anything around the world. Well, I can attest to your DMs being open because I just DM'd you earlier this morning and here you are. Right. So, it works. Right. I mean, that's it, how it, it works. Literally within an hour, we made this happen. How so I think cool is that? That's where, that, that's where the opportunities are today. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Yes, this has thank been awesome. you so much. It was awesome. Thank Appreciate you for having me. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Square. Develop on the platform that sellers trust. Here's what you could do with Square. You could bridge more experiences. You could build online, mobile, and in-person commerce experiences that connect more customers and sellers. You can build custom booking solutions. You can create and track orders. You can accept payments. You can manage and curate inventory. You can organize customers. You can manage employees. You can extend Square gift cards to your app. You can use Afterpay. And all this is powered by the world-class Square APIs and SDKs that enable you to build full featured business apps for yourself or millions of Square sellers. So much is available as a Square Solutions partner. Learn more and get started at changelog.com slash square. Again, changelog.com slash square. So Chad, it's uh, it's been a while, man. Yeah, it's been a few I years. I want to say I missed you. It's been a few years. You're, you're one of my favorite people well, out here, you know? For real. Come on, Stack. Th th yeah, for real. <laughs> Come on now. I, this you're making a, me blush. This is a moment right you're here. You're making me blush. You see this that? Is a, this is a reunion. This is why it's a That's podcast true. and not a video. Well, so you can't see me blushing, right? <laughs> this is a reunion. I think it's, it's special, too. I've been watching what you've been doing this century. Found it. I, I'm okay. happy that you're there. Yeah, thank for you. Sure. I'm happy thank for all you. the hard work you put thank out you. there, regardless of the road it took, you thank know, you. and how it ended. Yeah, you were always a hard worker. You always had a good yeah. heart in the mix, and we need more people like you yeah, out there doing it. the work for appreciate real. It. And I'm happy you're here. Well, like I was just saying before we jumped on the mics, you know, it was probably it was 2017. I was here two years. I forget if it was like 16, 17, or 17, 18, but yeah, I remember last time I saw you guys here. You had just launched a new brand, you yeah. know, because. I don't want to say that you guys were scrappy, but you were scrappy at the beginning. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then you came out with the Changelog brand and you had like, you really invested in it. You know yeah. what I mean? And took it to the next level and it was like, all right, I these guys fair. are like, they're, they they mean business, that's you fair. know? Yeah. They're going to do it. But yeah. that was like five years ago. You know what I mean? That was like. Yeah. Maybe more. Yeah. 2016 was the new brand. Yeah. Is that what it was? And yeah. It was so that was probably it. 2016 we're here. It was uh, October. Yeah. We literally were just launching it. Yeah. I think the website was maybe live a day, maybe a week. Yeah. It was not long. And the website we had was the, the last the, thing. The thin banner only, not this big banner behind <laughs> us. Yeah. yeah. We had a thin one and yeah. it just said like hacker to the heart. Hacker to the heart. Yeah. yeah. Cause we Gosh, are. I love it. Hacker to the heart. For well, sure. And now, so how many podcasts do you guys have now? Can you even keep track? You just like, you know, you lose them underneath the couch cushions yeah, at this point. Yeah, exactly, right. We do five weekly oh, yeah, that shows. Podcast. Oh, yeah, five yeah, yeah. weekly. Wow. So, you know, we got it's to an operation. We got to one a day. Okay. But across different podcasts, you know, okay. not like the change log five times a week. It's like okay. little verticals, you know? Yeah. yeah. That, was our, that was our move. 
and it's worked out pretty well because we have a lot more voices, yeah, a lot more diversity in yeah, the yeah. topics, everything. Well, than if it was just us two doing five shows a week, and you more know? burden to yeah. share too. I mean, if we try to do five shows a week and do all the work, yeah, it would never work. Of course, yeah. No, you so. got you got to scale it up. Well, because like, open source is a community of communities. You yeah, know right. what I mean, it's an interesting thing to think about the open source community and what it means. You know, because yeah. like people have different takes on it. But I like what you guys are doing. You're like, you've got the umbrella, but then you've got like the different, like you said, the voices mm -hmm. in it. Exactly. Bring it all I together. I think it works pretty well. Obviously, there's yeah. sub communities that we don't serve because yeah. you have to add another podcast to do that. You got to find the right person to partner with. And there's lots yeah. of things to do, you yeah. know, to get that done. But at the same time, you know, we're doing what we can and right. you know, we're I love reaching. It. The communities we reach, and then we, like you said, we have kind of the umbrella. Yeah. The change log's always going to be for everybody. Yeah. And so, yeah. how's the community around it? Because I remember you were launching like the Slack and the other stuff like that, and the website with it. Slack's still great. I mean, there's, yeah. it's active every day. There's a lot of people every day. Yeah. You didn't jump to Discord. You're still on Slack. We did not. We're we're, okay. we're on that uh, fence because it's a, it's. You a didn't struggle. go back to IRC. Yeah? We did not. We've okay. had a few people tell us to go <laughs> yeah, to of IRC. Of yeah. Course. It's a struggle because uh, it's hard to switch. You know, so. Oh, yeah. So Slack doesn't keep us with features necessarily. They keep yeah. us with pain to move. Yeah, right. right? Of course. And, like, you're going to lose people in that movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And uh, yeah. Slack is, is well known. Yeah, yeah, And a lot of people use it. So yeah. it's like, well, you know, I know you all have a Slack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a Slack. Other brands we work with have a Slack. So Absolutely. it's like, you know, how do you choose where to put <laughs> your, your community real-time messaging, basically? You know? We <laughs> want to be more open source aligned. We want to be more community right. focus aligned, but it's hard to make that switch when true, right? we have, we're so embedded. We have the Zulip you know? or the Mattermost. It's, or it's almost worth yeah. just paying for it, really. Yeah. yeah. We would entertain a community partner who would be like, we're sponsoring the community Slack or the community, whatever that might be. Okay. Find a way to do that. And yeah. that way it's like X per month and then maybe we profit a little bit, but yeah. maybe just have a surplus more or less to cover like higher months because Slack will go up or down based upon usage. We pay usage. you guys, right? Doesn't Century sponsor? Yeah. Century sponsors, right? Yeah. yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Good. For sure. Okay. No, we love you guys. We love you too. Um, are you using Century? Yeah. I What's use it uh, a couple times a week. Okay. Uh, Elixir, Phoenix. Every Monday for sure. Oh, that's Every right. Monday. I think I saw it. You're getting into the Phoenix stuff. Yeah. It's nice. I've been on. I mean, we've been on it ever since 2016. Really? I don't have any. I don't really have any complaints. Oh, wow. I'm slow to adopt the new stuff. They got a lot of new stuff in okay. the Phoenix world with Live View and a lot of the new component stuff. You okay. know, but I'm just. We yeah. deployed it in 2016 and just keep working on it. We're gonna do a redesign here soon and probably rethink. So that was pretty early. Some of our stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We were the only open source Phoenix app for a while that you could actually like look at and see how to build one. Okay. Kind of soup to nuts that was in production. Yeah. Now there's a handful of them. Plausible is a good one. Plausible. Plausible, yeah. I like plausible. Yeah, they're awesome. So what's uh what's new with you? Century man. What's uh Century how long has it been? You've been there. So what, I've been nine at Century months? for two years. Two, two years. Believe it. Believe it. You've you've been hiding there. Okay. okay. So maybe like nine months so ago you came out of the woodwork. So here's okay. what happened. Here's here's the story. Here's the story. So after Get Tip Gratipay, that wound down at the end of twenty seventeen. I thought it was Get it. But well, that was a huge controversy. That's matter. why I didn't go anywhere. Adam. Okay, okay. <laughs> Nobody can figure out how to pronounce it. All right, it, right? I digress. Yeah, okay, continue. No. Get tip, get it, um, grab a pay. Yeah, so wound that down at the end of 2017. And then had a little bit of a rebuilding year in 2018. And then I went to work as an engineering manager at a security company called Proofpoint for a couple of years. 2020, 2020, November 2020 is when I started at Century. And I came in as an engineer on the open source team, okay? Because Sentry, as you guys know, but somebody ends up listening to this, Sentry started life as an open source side project yeah. in 2008, way back. All right, yeah. so Kramer, 70 line Django plugin, um, you know, and it was just a community open source side project for years. Didn't start commercializing it until 2012. That happened on Heroku. <clears throat> I don't want to say RIP Heroku, but Heroku. And you know, five dollar a month plug-in on Heroku. That's yeah. when I started using it. Okay. And then, what? <clears throat> Let me fast forward. 20, 2012 commercialized. Twenty fifteen raised funds. Twenty sixteen came out. Hey, we're a startup now. And so now we're at three hundred people, right? Fast forward. Um, I joined. We were at like one thirty. 
and I joined as an engineer on the open source team, helping do release management around Sentry so people could still run it themselves. And then that evolved. So I was there for a year as an engineer, and then stuff kind of shifted. The fellow I was working with, he moved on. My boss changed what he was doing, and that's when I started the OSPO at Sentry. So I was there for years as an engineer, and then said, hey, let's start a true OSPO. And they said, all right, why don't you run it? So now I'm head of open source for a year. So it's been a year, what? Yeah. Yeah, today's November 1st, right? I was uh, just, it feels like nine months in my brain, but I think 12 okay. months is probably more accurate yeah. than I've like seen you like well, and the be thing out that there kind of more. Put me out there was the funding stuff, right? right? I think it's what yeah. we're getting to. It's like, yeah, so a year ago, yeah, published this thing uh, about Sentry's funding of open source software, which had always been there, but was kind of disorganized. And so a year ago is when we really got organized and put together a, a right proper program around funding open source. So that was a year ago, and then last year, uh, excuse me, last week, we just announced um, the second go around of that, you know? So Sentry's committed, and we're doing it again. Last year we did 155K, this year we did 260K. We're kind of tracking our growth as a company. Mm -hmm. So yeah, man, having fun. That's cool. It's great. Um, so funding's a big part of it. But Sentry, you know, Sentry, our whole product is open. Um, so a lot of what I'm working on now is helping our engineering culture scale to still have those conversations on GitHub, still have those discussions. You know, because we got like 100 plus engineers, it's really about helping Sentry engage with our user base, with the open source community, with the developer community on those open source channels, uh, primarily Git tip. Yeah. Excuse me, listen to me, Git tip. <laughs> <laughs> primarily GitHub, you know what I'm saying. Well, you know, when yeah, you man. say Git, you think tip, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Like, it's it, mind, I, would, I don't blame you, I, I mean, it. Get no. it. But get shout it. out to, to, to Charlie Shangako, who is still running Libera Pay. Do you guys remember this? Forked Gratapay. When Gratapay went down, yeah. he forked it, like the business and the code, and because it was open company, right? So he like forked it and is still running with it. Libera. Really? Wow. So it's still out there. You can still fund some free software folks on Libera That's Pay. Cool. Wow. Keeping the dream alive. Libera Pay. But, I didn't know that. When, when uh, you talk about the century stuff, you talk about it from the a numbers perspective so far. Yeah. How do you talk about it from an impact level? Like how do you how do I know you talk about community and engagement, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. how do you get specific with like the impact the of dollars side and the of impact. dollars in open source? I know that's been a big issue for you, yeah, your whole absolutely. career. So like, how do you quantify it there? Yeah. So I think with Sentry specifically, you know, we're trying to do breadth and depth. We're trying to give some folks a really significant amount of money, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars, right? Five, ten, twenty thousand dollars, and then we're also trying to go to go broad. Let's say. Like we poll our employees and say, hey, what are the projects you like? We try and give at least a little something to everybody. You know what I mean? Um, to try and grow it from both sides. Um, but really when we look at, like a lot of people say impact in funding, and there's this idea in open source funding that it's like, well. Who cares? I want, no, what I want to say is like the strings attached, right? Okay. It's like, so I'm going to give this money and then what are you going to do with it? You know, I'm going to right. follow up and like, well, did you do more poll requests? Like what was I the see. impact? Yeah. And the way we think about it, the way I think about it is like, look, I already got value from Here's you. Here's a free gift right back. Well, yeah, because you gave me the free gift. Right. Like, we spent this past year building on, like That's I was talking point. to Josh, like came up to me from TypeScript DS Lint, right? It's like, yeah. we've been getting value out of TypeScript DS Lint all year, right? And this is giving back for that value that we received. So, you know, he asked me, he's like, what can we do to, you know, to thank you or whatever? It's like, just keep doing what you're doing. You know, it's like, no strings attached, like keep, keep doing it, um, you know? And if we stop using your stuff, then we'll stop paying you, right? Yeah. It's like... Um, I appreciate that perspective because it's yeah. very much more on the uh, just appreciation side than it is on any yeah. sort of quid pro quo or yeah. any weirdness that goes on. It's like, no, this is for you. I already got my value. Because it can get weird, right? It can. Like if you bring money in and some folks don't want the money and that's fine. Right. You know, go back to this idea of open source community and the different ways to slice it. Like I do think of <laughs> open, the open source community having a commercial aspect and having a community aspect. Right. And a community supported aspect, right? So like some folks don't want any money, that's fine, right? Some folks like Sentry, like we think of ourselves as building open source software, we're doing it commercially, right? And but then there's this community supported um, open source, you know, part of the open source community. So I think of it as one community with these different aspects to it. And Sentry, like we see ourselves as part of the community, and so we're trying to take care of that community supported, you know, that part yeah. that's depending on that do right by the community, you know. How do you determine like numbers? How do you, First since, you're, since you run the OSPO, uh, yep. OSPO, not OSPO, yep. OSPO, OSPO, yeah, yeah. I, OSPO, I don't want to say 
Osmo. Osmo. Osprey. Oh. So, yeah. Osmo. Word? So you run Osmo, Osprey, right? Yeah. Um, how do you interface with the business side of Century? Now, of course, developers yeah. started the organization, so it's a little easier, yeah, but yeah, yeah. not all Osmos will have the luxury exactly. you have oh, yeah. in a dev-oriented so organi I mean, organization, yeah. right? But how do you say, give us this much money to put back? How do you quantify dollars? Sure. Is there some sort of like 10%? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five, is it a tie? Like, how do you right, think right, about right. it? Yeah. So, uh, again, I'm super lucky because, you know, David Kramer and Chris Jennings, the founders of the company, right. are, you know, all in on open source, right? So they're setting that tone from the top. Um, and Sentry, again, open source is a core part of our company identity. It's where we locate ourselves. We're a commercial open source company. We think of ourselves as an open source company. Okay, that said, I actually did some napkin math towards the end of Gratipay, get tip, get it. Um, where I, like I tried to think about it like from a first principles approach of what is fair, right? Like there's all this talk about fairness and you know companies making all this money off the backs of open source labor. It's like, all right, so time out, like, Let's have the conversation. What is fair? What like, what would be an amount that you saw a company giving, and you, as part of the community side of open source, community supported side, would be like, yeah, all right, that's cool, that's fair. The number we came up with, that I came up with at the time, that Century has picked up with, is two thousand dollars per year, per developer employed at Century. Okay, let me unpack that. That was a lot, yeah, right there. Yeah, please say that again. Or yeah. Something. So, two thousand dollars a year, and the thinking is like. All right, how do we value this? There's a few different ways to value it. Here's how we're going to think about it. What we're doing is making our developers more productive. Because if that open source software didn't exist, what would we have to do? Write it We'd yourself. Have, write it ourselves, right? Yeah. Write it ourselves or pay somebody else for it, right? Right. So, kind of, you know, and, you know, like we maybe put some links somewhere if this goes anywhere, but like, yeah, that, that's what we ended up with. It was like looking globally at, all right, what's the, making some bunch of assumptions. What's the amount that our developers, like, you know, what's the amount by which their productivity is increased because of the open source software that they have available? And the, yeah, the number we came up with was $2,000 a year, right? That that's the increase in their productivity. Now, you can argue with that, you can differ, but the point is, let's have that conversation to say, first principles, like, what is fair? So let's start from that. And so, you know, we did 155 last year, you know, so last year it was like, all right, we got 75 devs, we got 2,000 bucks a pop, 150 is our budget. Now we figure out how to spend it as a separate thing, right. right? And so this year, set the budget you know, a while ago, but yeah, we put it at 260, so it's a, roughly in line with our growth as a company, but it's pegged to 2,000 per engineer on staff. Okay. Does that answer your question, Adam? Yeah, Yeah. it does. I mean, because a lot of what's happening with OSPOs is burgeoning, like it's new, so new okay. orna organizations are taking this more seriously, yep. taking the principles of giving back to open source more seriously, yep. and as you see more and more folks like you guys yeah. be examples to follow, you gotta think like, what's the science, yeah. right? Yeah. How do I determine my number? Is it like, is it per the money we make? Yeah, is it revenue, yeah, yeah, is yeah. it a tithe, is it 10%? Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. how do we quantify the dollar amount? And I think that's a good number, because you do base it on engineers, yep. obviously, I can't think of one engineer who would develop anything and not use open source. Yeah, so yeah. obviously there's, a, everywhere now, there's right? a touch yeah, point yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's a that's yeah. a key metric, right? You yeah. wouldn't say, well, and come up with something, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it. It's something that somebody can adopt pretty easily. Okay, 2K. Maybe it's like, okay, we can't do 2K, but we'll do 1K. Sure. But we'll base it on engineers. Exactly. We have 50 engineers. Just it's 1K. Anchor, there's 50 thousand right. dollars. So that's how we know? think about it. Yeah. Again, different ways you could. You could do a percentage. Ten would be high of, well, it depends on what you do it, but yeah. yeah. So that's that's the that's the how you set the budget side, and then then there's how you divvy it up, right? Um, and what I like here is like we're getting better and better tools, right? Like you remember five years ago, six years ago, when we were talking, you're like, did Git, GitHub sponsors? Did that even exist? You no, know no. what I mean? Like Open Collective, barely. Barely, like, yeah. Um, you know, Git Tip, Gratipay was winding down. Some others, Liberapay was coming up. Um, you know, Patreon was was still pretty early days, but now like we've got GitHub sponsors, we've got Open Collective. And what I love now is these new platforms, thanks.dev, so shout out to thanks.dev and to StackAid, um, two new platforms that we did pilots with for this year's Century funding program. So we use, you know, we do our foundations, right, like direct payments to you know, Python Software Foundation and Open Source Initiative and different. But then we use these four platforms to, uh, yeah, give out these uh, <coughs> donations to kind of the long tail, right? Um, anywhere from, yeah, like six, seven thousand dollars for the year, down to like a hundred bucks for the year, right? The long tail again, going back to that depth and that breadth. And what enables that is these platforms. 
Um, and so Open Collective and GitHub sponsors are kind of that, I want to call it the first generation and maybe GitTip was like the zeroth generation or something. There's even older ones too, right? Pledgy, shout out to Pledgy. You remember Pledgy, that one? Yeah, yeah. Pledgy. Oh, yeah. they, were, they were integrated into GitHub. They That's had a partnership right. with GitHub where they were like in the sidebar. You remember that? Good old, old days. Old school, right? Yeah. Um, Guess who else was integrated on the GitHub? Uh-oh. We GitHub.com slash explore. No. You explore or trending? Tell me a story. Explore. Explore. Tell me a story. The, the early days. Like, this is way, way early days. So our RSS feed of our podcast Heck was yeah. live. Like, it would, like, take the RSS Dude, and turn it happened? to HTML what happened? on Explore in the sidebar. GitHub, they changed, you know. Yeah. I mean. I mean, Microsoft. Yeah. I don't know. Before yeah. that. Yeah. Before yeah, it was before Microsoft days. But we're 20 days. They were, yeah, they no, were. No, no, It makes sense. Yeah. But, well. They grew yeah, up. It was, it, was cool. it was great. Well, it was great. Well, last yeah, it made That's sense. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That's super. Well, here's a fun little sidebar. Then, last year we did our funding program, and then we did a follow-up, uh, like virtual event, with half a dozen maintainers, and it was hosted by myself and Jessica Lord. Shout out Jessica, yeah. the um, PM for GitHub sponsors. Yep. Right. Yep. And here's the fun thing I'm trying to get to. <clears throat> Sent. Am I going to tell the story? Yeah. Sentry's creative director. Founding creative director, he's no longer there. Um, did great work. Uh, he came from GitHub, because Chris Jennings, one of our founders, came from GitHub, brought Cameron with him. And so Cameron uh, invented the Octocat. Is that right? Yeah. Nice. And then ended up at Sentry, like did all the Sentry stuff. Now has moved on. Um, and so when we went to do this event together, we were like, hey, hey GitHub, <clears throat> we want to do artwork <clears throat> that includes the Sentry, like, you know, character, and Mona, the Octocat, like in one artwork. And at first they were like, yeah, no, we don't do that. <laughs> and then, you know, we had some conversations. And long story short, you can go on, you know, we'll put the link in or whatever. But yeah, there's a, there, that artwork made it out to nice. the light of day. So we got a little Sentry GitHub collab a going collab. on. A so, collab. Yeah. Nice. You know, just a moment. It's right. not the feed, right? Where right. it's like evergreen, yeah, it's but just feed. like a little, little moment. Anyway, yeah, that stuff's fun, right? We've done some collabs over the yeah. years with them. Heck we had Jessica yeah. Lord on the show. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as really, well as, look. Uh, Devin Zugel. Say again? Oh, we did oh, a yeah, show with Devin sure. when, when sponsors first launched. Okay. And then we did a show with Jessica Lord when yeah. she took over. Mm -hmm. I just think it's so awesome to see. Now it feels like status quo, right? Now it feels right. like GitHub sponsors, which is awesome, right? It's like right. now we've got that baseline. And now what I'm seeing with Thanks Dev and with Stack Aid is like next level. Which is just what we need. We need to keep moving it forward, you know? Figure out how to make it easier for companies like Sentry. Like, I'm doing a lot of grunt work to make this work. The easier we can make it for companies, like you said, like find those simple, all right, here's the simple story, here's the right amount, you know? Here's how you get it to the right, right. Uh, dependencies, like the simpler we make it. I mean, what I want to see is like, I don't want Sentry to be out front, like, oh, good job, Sentry, you have this great program. I want it to just be like, of course, like everybody does this. It has to be normal, you know what right. I mean? That's where we're going to really have that. I mean, this is kind of getting back to what you were asking about impact and how we think about impact. You know, some of it is, yeah, the impact on the projects themselves right now. But look, let's be honest. Like, $260,000 isn't actually that much. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a lot, yeah. but it's not a lot. Yeah. When you look at, you know, the open SSF that has like $5 million, you know, like, here you go, right? Like, the larger the, the, the fangs and everybody, like Microsoft, they're able to do these larger dollar amount things. But relative to the size of their company, that's what we look at right. um, and feel good about what we're doing. Is yeah. that like, Have you ever thought about if more organizations that made sense now, like maybe yeah. really dev-focused organizations yeah. took on this idea of 2K, 1K per? Do it, man. Let's do it. Yeah, you know, what would 1K, happen? Like, 2K. have you ever quantified that number? Like, I mean, in the sense that I started from that to get to the 2K, to yeah. be like, well, here's the value and here's the number of, you know, Here's the, here's this, again, we, this is a few years ago I wrote this thing, but like, here's the size of the tech industry worldwide, and here's the 22 million software developers in the world or whatever, right? right? And like, do okay. that division. So, from that point of view, starting there, um, but yeah, bottom up, it's like every year we just need, like, Spotify uh, just put out a program, you know what I mean? Right. Did you have them on? Did you talk to, to Pear from Spotify? Not about that. Yeah, so, no. so they, did a, they did a thing. Um, you know, I, I saw, you know, even Chrome just did like, well, what, GitHub did half a million earlier this year, um, and then Chrome has half a million for web frameworks. 44 billion. 
That's Sega. how much it would be if it was years twenty two million if, times two thousand. If it was two thousand dollars times twenty four million developers across the world. It sounds about yeah because that's forty four billion it, dollars. Like, how big? It, yeah, because I, was I had to do the math. I'm like, sorry. No, I appreciate I, I you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Because if you think about, think about it this way: the open source, the community supported open source ecosystem community. <laughs> think of it as like another sleeping tech giant. Mm. Okay, you got how many? Tens of thousands working for Microsoft, for you know Meta now, I guess you know Apple, Amazon. Like the open source community is like another tech giant, right? Right. So look at how much revenue do those you know tech giants bring in, and like use that as the benchmark for the revenue that the open source, like the value that the open source community is bringing to the world. Yeah, that's the way to think about it. Yeah, I guess it's it's kind of good impact, too to put right? that. Yeah, you put that money back in the hands of the. You know, the maintainers and the creators and whatnot. You guys want something controversial? Mildly controversial? Please, sure. Okay. Sure, there's a why discount. Not? There's a discount. The flip side of this is there's a tax. And it's not the same for everybody, but when you average it out, there's people that will work on open source software for a lot less than you would need to pay them to work on your proprietary software. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that factors into it, to be honest, right? It's like, and this was me, because you remember when I was doing Git it. I pronounced it that way for you, Adam. <laughs> Thank you. When I was doing Get It, like I was there on the I platform. I swear you said Get It originally. I'm sure I did. You're sure right. I'm probably on tape with you. Yeah, I think it. so. Yeah. I'll, we'll go back. We'll go back. We'll if we have the, it, the we're gonna put it here right now. The archives. Yeah. So we're here today to talk about sustaining open source. Can you help us talk about that, Chad? Oh my heavens! Absolutely. All right. So Chad Whitaker is my name. Get It is my game. <laughs> GetIt.com is a website which primarily right now is being used by open source developers and the companies that love them. And it's a crowdfunding site where you can go and you can set up a dollar a week or $3 a week as a gift to someone whose work you love and admire and are inspired by. Yeah, like I was working for not very much money really hard on Get It because I loved it because the right. intrinsic motivation, the passion, you know what I mean? And I think, like that, that there, there's something there. We don't need to focus on that, but it's like, yeah. Well, uh, what I think that means is that there's a way to make this work. Let, let's bring it back around to this. I think that we can actually get to the dream, and the dream is for again going back to that idea of there's an open source community, there's a commercial open source side, there's a side that doesn't want any money at all, but then there's that community supported portion. We can make it work. We can make sure that those folks in the community supported open source, you know, part of open source, that they get what they need. You know what I mean? That they get their, is it $70,000, $80,000, $100,000 a year? Enough for the health insurance, you know what I mean? Like, that's what we're trying to get to is the careers, right? To right. be like, kid coming out of school is like, I see a viable option. Jessica talks about this from GitHub, right? Yeah. Like, I see a viable option to go into open source as a career on that community supported level. Yeah. I think we can get there. Maybe not next year, but we keep <laughs> chipping away, you know, and it'll it'll tip. We got to hit that tipping point. And it's predicated on the fact that your organization uses that open source. So you said if you stop using X, yeah. you, you just stop move giving your X. budget somewhere else. And it's yeah, not because yeah. you don't value their work yeah, anymore, it's yeah. because you literally don't use their work anymore. So Yeah, which the, basically is not valuing their work yeah, anymore, right. but not I mean, in the sense yes, of like a personal right. thing. It's sure. not like you a, know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what I mean by that. Yeah. It, is that the work is still valued, but you're not using it anymore. So organizationally, yeah. you're not valuing it. So therefore, the dollars you put into the OSPO funding bucket, yeah. whatever it's called, now yeah, gets yeah. allocated to the Go projects you are using. So exactly. that, you know, if you have users, you should have funding. Yeah. I mean, right? jQuery. Somebody's still using jQuery. A lot of people are using jQuery. Right? It's only like 83% yeah. of websites a couple years ago. Mate, like, there's, that's fine, man. There's different parts of the tech curve. Um, yeah, I think we can figure it out. There's still a lot yeah. of work to do. Appreciate well, you guys. Uh, to the road ahead. Helping, helping with the story. Yeah, to you the road ahead, yeah. for sure, man. I, I'm glad absolutely. to have you back on to explain it because, uh, yeah. seriously, we missed yeah. you. Yeah, thanks, I was, man. I, I saw missed you pop you up too. nine months, 12 months ago, and I was yeah. like, whoa. Yeah. There's Chad, it's working fun. at Century. He's back. Yeah. And by the way, you all probably know this, Century's one of our sponsors, we love them. Yeah. But I was like, wow, there's Chad, working yeah. at Century, that's awesome. And well. we love Century, and we use Century, and it's amazing, so. Heck yeah. We yeah. appreciate you guys too, man. Good to see you, Chad. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Love you guys. Love you too. All right. Love you.
Love you. To wrap it up? <laughs> yeah. All right. That's it. Cool. Cool. It's wrapped. This episode is brought to you by Retool, and they have a private beta ready for you to check out. This is the fastest way to now build native mobile apps for your mobile workforce. There is no complex frameworks anymore or tedious deployments. You can build mobile apps with what you already know, like JS and SQL. This is all in their browser, no code, or what they call low code. Join the wait list, head to retool.com slash products slash mobile. The link will be in the show notes. Again, retool.com slash products slash mobile. You guys are making my my whole year do this. Yeah? You seriously are, man. <laughs> no, but I'm 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 being sort of you know genuine. This is like uh, you guys just uh, just absolutely kill podcasting. Thank you, man. We we aim to please, so you know uh, we're here at all things open. We got Ricardo. Ricardo, yeah, that's right. Ricardo. Ricardo. How do you say your last name, Ricardo? It's Suedas. It's, Suedas. A, it's a Spanish name, but yes. it's actually from Galicia. So I often, when I when I uh, go to Portugal, yeah. they get excited, right? Because they think it's a Portuguese name, but it's actually Spanish. So Suedas. 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 Not, not a very common name. No, but, I've uh, never seen that one before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So open source, AWS. What do you do? Tell us. Hi, everyone. Well, listen, first of all, I just want to say a massive thank you for you know, inviting me on here, right? It's a, it's a real dream come true for me. Hey, but yeah. what I do is I... We love I, having listeners on. Sorry? We love having listeners on. Yeah. <laughs> having listeners on the show is the best. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what I do is I, I've been working in open source for over 20 years, and uh, more recently I joined AWS as a developer advocate. And so what I try and do is I try and kind of act as the voice of the open source developers so internally. And okay. I, I, I hope I try and make AWS the best place to run open source technology. Okay. So a lot of the time I spend speaking with uh, builders. We call builders the people who actually do the hands-on stuff. So that could be a maintainer. It could be someone just you know, doing some documentation for a project or actually just running it, right? And then really excited about how they've run it in a specific way and want to share that with everyone. Right? So I yeah. do a weekly newsletter and I do a, a bi-weekly Twitch start show where we try and get some of that energy out so more people can you know, know about these open source projects, right? Is this all internal? No, it's external. Okay. So, so, I, so the Twitch sessions is external, the newsletter is external, and I try and feature the projects that you know, people create. Okay. And, 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 and they, you know, they fit in lots of different categories, right? But a lot of them are developer experience. So you know, AWS is, is a, a great um, you know, a tool for building stuff on, right? But sometimes people want like a, you know, to make things simpler. So they build an open source project that solves a lot of problems, right? right. Uh, and so I see a lot of that. I see a lot of these really cool projects that then people uh, love using. So a good one uh, from a guy called Australia, Ian McKay. Uh, he created this tool, open source tool called Forma 2. And it allows you to, from your console, reverse engineer CloudFormation scripts through, through, a, through a GUI tool, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's tools like that, right? That, uh, that every week, I, I'm amazed, right? Because I, I do a weekly newsletter and I feature these in my weekly newsletter. And I'm always blown away by the creativity, the passion yeah. that yeah. these people have. Well, you do what we do, basically, but you do it for AWS, and we do it for open source at large, you or do. I guess software at large, right? I mean, but there is no, yeah, there is no we uh, trench do we don't dig in, you we know. Can't do it and put it out there. Yeah, and, and actually, that and that's why I love your podcast, right? Because every every week, right, I get to know about a new different open source project, right, or an insight, and uh, uh, that I didn't know about before. Yeah, and and it's not always just about the project, right? What I learned from you guys is. The, the stuff around actually how you build the project, what the inner workings of it, the things that you don't necessarily think, but when I speak to customers, right, they want to know how this stuff works. Yeah. And increasingly, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm quoting stuff from your podcast. What? Yeah, yeah, seriously. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> that's the way to do it, Jared. Yeah, what do you totally. think? That's a lot of pressure. I'm going to have to start saying quote worthy <laughs> stuff more often. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. You win some, you lose some. You win. <laughs> quote me on that. <laughs> 
But I, I mean, I, I got I got a question for you, right? Okay. So you've, you've, okay. Been, you've been doing it for a long, long time, okay? Yeah. yeah. And every week you, you keep the energy, you keep, you're, you're just as enthusiastic. So how do you do it? What is it that makes you kind of like get up and think, yeah, we're doing another change log? I got it, man. Go ahead. You got to love the game. Yeah. If you love the game, it's easy. Yeah, totally, man. You know what I mean? No, that's, that's cliche to say, but if you do love the game, even if you get tired a little bit, you can still kind of show up for the most part. But if you love the game, you kind of come at it and you enjoy it. And yeah. you find, like you do, with new passions, you see what people are making. And you get, yeah. like, their energy gives you energy, you know. I, the world of software is just, like, always, always changing. So, like, every single year, it's kind of the same but kind of different. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's the same in the fact that it's technology and right. it's movement, it's innovation. But it's like, what's going to be big this year? Generative AI? Was it? Yeah. Web three, well, maybe not. not you know, <laughs> it's like you know, web five it's now, web five platforms, no ops. You know what I mean? No ops required. A yeah. lot of things like that. Automation happening. So I mean, every year, every six months, it's always something new, always something changing. So that yeah. sort of like constant change kind of keeps me going personally. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Jared? What keeps you? Yeah, I would say mostly it's the people. You know, when you're, how can you not get excited to talk to somebody who's yeah. wicked smart and like passionate and driven and interesting person? who's doing something in the yeah. world, it's hard not to be excited about yeah, that yeah, yeah. each and every week. Of course, sometimes, you know, some days are easier to do it than other days, and some days we're like, <laughs> especially a week where we're doing like JS Party, and maybe we're doing a backstage, and it's like, how many podcasts can I record this right, week? Right, right. And by Friday, we're kind of like- And then ship. Like, yeah, and then <laughs> ship as well. And then ship too. But, but it's hard, because the thing is, I mean, I do my weekly news, I've been doing it two and a half years, right? And I know how, how hard it is sometimes just to get up and, and just, go through it, right? Yeah. Like you've been doing it for more than two years, right? So that takes, that takes something, right? 13 plus years. Yeah. 13 plus years. And what I like as well is that I like how you interject within the people you have and the stories you tell, the stuff you're doing with your own sites, right? Yeah, you say, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, we're doing this way, we tried this and we tried that way and we found this work, so what, what, what should we do? And I, and mm -hmm. I, just, I think that's the key to a good podcast, right, is asking the right questions and you just yeah. know how to do it. And I think it's because you, you're practitioners, you, you do this stuff, right? That's exactly the thing. Like, yeah. One of the things that my, my fears uh, as a podcaster about software is that I will, be, uh, I will turn into a guy who only asks questions yeah, yeah. and not a guy who actually does stuff. Yeah. And so we stay, you know, we, we build software, we're, we're developing things, and we can actually call, call to mind things that we were doing earlier that day or that yeah. week or challenges we're having. And you can't really fake that. And so if we quit writing code and we quit building stuff and we just talk to people, well, you lose a bit of your yeah. edge. And so I found that in the university, a lot, of the, a lot of the teachers there lost their edge. You know, my best professor when I was in school was a guy who was adjunct and he taught databases at night because he was out there in the field building databases all day. He yeah. couldn't teach during the day because he was doing databases. And then he came and taught us. And I was like, this guy knows his stuff. Yeah. Versus the guy who theorizes and is smart yeah, yeah. and eloquent but doesn't actually build databases all day. Yeah. I, he I was think my best good. teacher. And so I was like, okay, there's something to this. We need people who are out there doing the stuff, yeah. talking about the stuff. It's so much better, more beneficial. Yeah. yeah. That's a good In the good trenches. Point. Yeah, in the trenches for sure. Yeah, but it's hard though, right? Because a lot of people, I mean, that's a good example because I know in, the, in my past, right, when I was doing training courses, I didn't do many of them. Yeah. But the, the difference between a good one and a bad one was one that just basically went through the process, right? And the other one, when you ask questions as well, yeah, I do training three days a week, but two days I'm doing consulting or I'm actually doing this stuff. And then they, and they actually bring back some of their work into, the, into right. the training, right? So it makes it everything real and relevant, right? Yeah. And I, actually, I, I, it's, I'm doing a lot of stuff with students at the moment because I'm very passionate about education. I used to do a side hustle of running a school. Um, okay. Uh, not technology, though, just just um, mainstream school. Sure. Because um, I, I kind of like try to kind of, uh, in, in the UK, there's a, it's, it's very hard for a group of kids who kind of fall through the gaps. Yeah. And they end up nowhere, right? So my school was for that kind of like, group of kids that kind of fell through the gaps but they were wow. lovely kids right they just needed a bit more support that normal school can give you and and, and one of the things i'm doing um with students is um teaching them open source nice and and it because it, it's interesting because you know i go i speak to customers right and they have a very wide knowledge of, of open source right but there's few that do it really, really well and know their stuff the vast majority that you know in the middle somewhere but too many just don't know anything, right? right. So what we're trying to do is um, go in and teach, uh, you know, kids, students age 18 over, trying to give them some of the important 
you know, baseline, if it, and, we, and also starting from the history, starting from the past. You know, what is copyright? What, where did open source come from? You know, what was the Free Software Foundation? So that they don't end up in a situation where they're making poor choices, right? Yeah. Because you see that a lot. I see that. I, I sometimes see projects, and they, and they, and they make some schoolboy errors, right? When it comes yeah. to the licensing or how they think about community and all this kind of stuff, right? So, so that education thing is really important to me at the moment. So I'm, I'm spending a lot of time with that, and, that, and that's even though I'm, I'm doing that in an AWS, I don't really touch about AWS much. It's more generic open source, right? Right. right. But it's cool. It's really Very cool. cool. So tell us uh, real quick as we close up. Tell us your newsletter, the Twitch stream. Like, how can people connect with that stuff? Yeah. So um, I'm on Dev2 uh, under the AWS. So unfortunately, I don't have a very friendly URL I can share with you. Okay. But if you just Google uh, AWS Open Source, you should find the newsletter. And the show we do every other week. Are, are, it's on Fridays, and it's Twitch.tv.aws. So okay. awesome. I'd love to see That's some easy. of the Changelog family come along and, uh, and check it yeah, out. Yeah, for sure. For we'll sure. Do that. And, and again, yeah. thank you a lot. Guys, this has really made my, my we week. Appreciate hey, it. We appreciate it. We're happy to, uh, to talk to Ricardo, so thank you for talking to us. Thank you. All right. Oh my God, that is just <laughs> mind blown. Is that it? <laughs> High five, dude. That's it. The show's done. Thank you for tuning in. It was a blast meeting all things open and an even bigger blast meeting fans, new and old, and everywhere in between. Again, a big thanks to Todd Lewis and team for having us at All Things Open. We appreciate the invite. Of course, big thank you to our friends and partners at Fastly and Fly. Also to Breakmaster Cylinder. Those beats are banging. All right, that's it. The show's done. Thank you for tuning in. We will see you on Monday. Monday.